The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear Joanne describing her home city of Darwin in Australia to a man called Rob, who hopes to go there. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Joanne? Hi! You must be Rob. Nice to meet you. So, I hear you're planning to visit Australia. Yeah, and I really wanted to talk to you because I was thinking of spending some time in Darwin and my sister told me you're from there. That's right. So, tell me about it. Well, where shall I start? Well, Darwin's in what they call the top end because it's right up at the northern end of Australia and it's quite different from the rest of Australia in terms of cultural influences. In fact, it's nearer to Jakarta in Indonesia than it is to Sydney, so you get a very strong Asian influence there. That means we get lots of tourists. People from other parts of Australia are attracted by this sort of international cosmopolitan image. And as well as that, we've got the same laid-back atmosphere you get all over Australia, probably more so, if anything, because of the climate. But what a lot of the tourists don't realise until they get there is that the city's also got a very young population. The average age is just 29, and this makes the whole place very buzzy. Some people think that there might not be that much going on as far as art and music and dancing and so on are concerned because it's so remote. I mean, we don't really get things like theatre and opera in the same way as cities down in the south, like Sydney, for example, because of the transport expenses. But in fact, what happens is that we just do it ourselves. Lots of people play music, classical as well as pop, and there are things like artists' groups and writers' groups and dance classes. Everyone does something. We don't just sit and watch other people. You said it's very international? Yeah, they say there's over 70 different nationalities in Darwin. For instance, there's been a Chinese population there for over 100 years. We've even got a Chinese temple. It was built way back in 1887, but um, when a very bad storm, a, a cyclone in fact, hit Darwin in the 1970s, it was almost completely destroyed. And the only parts of the temple that survived were part of the altars and the stone lions. But after the storm, they reconstructed it using modern materials. It's still used as a religious centre today, but it's open to tourists too, and it's definitely worth going to see it. Oh, and as far as getting around goes, you'll see places that advertise bicycles for hire, but I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of the year it's just so hot and humid. Some tourists think it'll be fine because there's not much in the way of hills and the traffic's quite light compared with some places, but believe me, you're better off with public transport. It's fine and not expensive. Or you can hire a car, but it's not really worth it. What's the swimming like? Well, there are some good beaches, but the trouble is that there's this nasty creature called the box jellyfish, and if it stings you, you're in bad trouble. So you have to be very careful most of the year, especially in the winter months. You can wear a lycra suit to cover your arms and legs, but I wouldn't like to risk it even so, personally. And there are the saltwater crocodiles too. I mean, I don't want to put you off. There are protected swimming areas netted off where you'll be safe from jellyfish and crocs, or there are the public swimming pools. They're fine, of course. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So, which places would you specially recommend? Well, one of the most popular attractions is called Aquacene. What happens is, every day at high tide, hundreds of fish come in from the sea, all different sorts, including some really big deep sea fish. And some of them will even take food from your hand. It's right in the middle of town at the end of the Esplanade. It's not free. I think you have to pay about $5. But it's definitely something you have to experience. Then, of course, Darwin has a great range of food. Being such a cosmopolitan place, and if you don't have lots to spend, the best place to go is to Smith Street Mall, where they have stalls selling stuff to eat. There's all sorts of different things, including Southeast Asian dishes, which I really like. You'd think there'd be plenty of fresh fish in Darwin, as it's on the coast, but in fact, because of the climate, it mostly gets frozen straight away. But you can get fresh fish in the restaurants on Cullen Bay Marina. It's a nice place to go for a special meal, and they have some good shops in that area too. What else? Well, there's the Botanic Garden. It's over 100 years old and there's lots to see. An orchid farm, rainforest, a collection of palm trees, uh, a wetlands area. You can easily spend an afternoon there. That's at Fanny Bay, a couple of kilometres out to the north. Then if you've got any energy left in the evening, the place to go is Mitchell Street. That's where it all happens as far as clubs and music and things are concerned. You'll bump into lots of my friends there. Talking of friends, why don't I give you some email addresses? I'm sure they wouldn't mind. If you... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech given by the head of a company to some new employees. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 16. First of all, a warm welcome to Barker's Country Safaris. We're delighted to have you all on board for this season. I know you've all been told a bit about the company when you had your job interview, but I thought it would be worth telling you a bit more about ourselves. Barker's was set up 10 years ago by myself, John, and my then girlfriend and now wife, Nancy. We started it initially just as a hobby, we felt that there was a good opportunity to share our love of the countryside in this part of the world with the many visitors who come here. As you know, most people come for the beaches in the summer, but there is so much more to the region, and this is what we wanted to exploit. Nancy and I were born near here, and as teenagers we went climbing, kayaking, white water rafting, potholing, and just straightforward walking. This district is in our blood, and we love it. <laughs> While we were still at university, we started taking small groups of visitors out into the National Park in Nancy's brother's old Land Rover. We'd drive them around the back lanes and into the forest. 
We'd also organize rock climbing tours for friends of friends. Then each year, without us having to advertise, people came back to us to ask for more excursions and trips. So, five years ago, we gave up our other jobs to focus full time on Barker's country safaris. Now, two years after that, we set up the activity tour part of the business, and one year ago, we expanded into organizing activities for school groups during term time. Obviously, this was a massive challenge with all the health and safety requirements, but it's proving a great success. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions seventeen to twenty. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Anyway, we'll certainly not be dealing with school parties during the summer holidays. Our clients for the next three months are mostly family parties or groups of friends, and I'd like to talk a bit now about the tours we offer. And what your responsibilities will be. Our most popular excursion is the Woodland Tour and Trail. Now, often this is sold out, and we have all of our ten jeeps and convoy with eight people in each jeep. It's a lot of fun. These tours really offer a taster of what we can provide. So, as both driver and guide, it is important that you do a good job here, so they come back for the bigger tours. Uh, I will talk about the commission package later. As the summer days are so long, we have three tours each day, but you will not be expected to work on more than two of them. Morning tours start at eight a.m. and go to midday. Afternoon tours are from two p.m. to six p.m. and then evening ones seven p.m. to eleven p.m. All the tours follow the same route, and you should have made yourselves familiar with all the key information. This was provided to you in the information pack you were sent when you accepted the job offer. This is important, so if you haven't had time yet, please do so now. Our second most popular tour is the family exclusive. Now, this tour is for the whole day and for only one group. Usually, it is just one jeep, but sometimes there are two if the party is large. These tours go from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. and include lunch at the Brown Bear in Lower Middleton. We have a number of different routes for these tours, as we don't want our premium clients being made to feel that they are part of a large package deal. Uh, you will be told which route to take with your weekly schedule. Now, I'd like to move on to these specialty tour packages. These are the ones that we are keen to book people on once they've done the woodland tour and trail trip. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture about the Miners Hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good evening and welcome to the Minor Hotel. We are pleased to have you as our guest. I will give you a brief information session to tell you everything you need to know to make this a pleasant stay. The Minor Hotel was built in the 1850s, during the Gold Rush period, also nicknaming our state the Golden State. People from all over the country and even from other countries came to seek their fortune here in these hills, creating cities overnight. In this city, many Gold Rush hotels soon opened up. This particular hotel was built in 1851, but was destroyed during an earthquake. It was rebuilt in 1995 to recreate the feel of the Gold Rush, complete with articles and actual photographs from during the 1850s. Our hotel is divided into two buildings, one called the Gold Tower, and the other is named the Fortune Tower. You will be staying in the Fortune Tower on the 25th floor, complete with great views of the city. Your room is the best room in the hotel, complete with private living room and hot tub. Here is your room card. On the card it will say FT, meaning Fortune Tower. On the bottom of the card it will say 2515, the 25 stands for the 25th floor, and the 15 stands for the 15th room on that particular floor. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. There are emergency exits in both towers of the hotel. They are located on the south side, opposite the elevators. Please use these in case of a fire or other emergency. We have some special events happening this week. Our Miner's Diner is offering a special Miner's Buffet dinner this Friday and Saturday for only $20 per person. This special includes all food, not including drinks and alcohol, and shows for the night. The buffet will be available from 5 to midnight. Because of the historical significance of our hotel, there are some special rules. The first rule is that there is no smoking allowed anywhere in the building, not even in your own room. This is not only to ensure the safety and health of our guests, but also the furniture and pictures can be easily damaged by smoke and other harsh treatment. Please remember that there are items of furniture over a hundred years old here, so respect the rules by not smoking. Secondly, please do not take pictures using a flash of any of the drawings and paintings in the rooms or hallways as they are old and fragile. We are doing our best to preserve a national treasure, so please help us in doing so. Lastly, you will only have one set of towels and bed sheets per three days. This is to conserve the water supply, as there are frequent droughts this high up in the hills. If there are any further questions, the staff of the hotel will be available to answer your questions. In the event that no one is able to answer your questions, I will also be available from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day in the concierge. I hope you enjoy your stay here with us. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk about the tall ships race in Britain. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In July 1956, a fleet of 21 sailing ships from 11 countries raced each other from Torbay in Devon to Lisbon. The ships had been converted from cargo carrying to sail training ships. However, their future seemed uncertain and the purpose of the gathering was to mark the passing of the age of the sail. What happened instead was that the sailing ships refused to say goodbye and two years later they raced again and the fleet was even larger. It was then that the title The Tall Ships was given to them and the name remains today. The original organisers, the Sail Training Ship International Race Committee, now called the Sail Training Association, saw that a new international movement had begun, adventure training under sail. As race succeeded race, it became clear that the events had more to do with bringing adventure and widening the horizons of young people than of commemorating the passing of sail. Now, sail training ships began to be specially built and young people from all walks of life wanted to participate. Now, to compete, a vessel has to satisfy just three requirements. It has to have a minimum waterline length of 9.09 metres, half its crew must be between the ages of 16 and 25, and its principal means of propulsion must be a sail. Since 1972, the race has been sponsored by Cutty Sark Scott's Whiskey, and it has started to attract huge crowds of spectators. In 1984, more than 250,000 people lined the River Mersey in Liverpool to watch the fleet set off. And in 1986, two million spectators joined Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth at Newcastle-upon-Tyne to watch the parade. 1989 was the year that the spectacular Cutty Sark Tall Ships Race started from London. A grand fleet of up to 100 vessels gathered on the River Thames near Tower Bridge on Tuesday the 4th of July. The only thing that the racing yachts, ancient and modern, had in common was their young crews. Few were expert sailors and the majorities were strangers to the sea and to each other. Between Tuesday the 4th of July, when the fleet began to assemble, and Saturday the 8th of July, when the ships took part in a grand parade of sail down the River Thames, vessels were berthed on either side of Tower Bridge. Some were moored in the Pool of London, opposite the Tower of London, while others were moored to the east of Tower Bridge. Smaller vessels were accommodated in St Catherine's Dock, Many of the larger ships were open to the public. It was an amazing and historic spectacle as the ships sailed slowly up the River Thames. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.